So, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, thank you, Professor Daniel Vargas, for this generous introduction. And uh, I'm delighted to be in this panel with a very friend of FGV, Professor David Trubick, and also Professor Fabio Silva. Thank you, Professor David Jackson, for inviting me to be here to this important symposium and especially this panel discussing law and political science. Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm pleased and honored to be here today, back to New Haven, back to Yale University, where I had the unique opportunity to develop a deep research about the U.S. administrative state under the supervision of Professor Susan Rosakerman from Yale Law School. The 1891 Brazilian Constitution, which was modeled upon that of the United States, institutionalized Brazilian federalism and the separation of powers. So, math of comparative research between the Brazilian and North American institutional legal system was, and still is, in my view, relevant in Brazilian <coughs> constitutional matters. There are studies on the federalism, on the separation of powers, <coughs> on the presidential system, and on the checks and balance system. Indeed, case tried by the U.S. Supreme Court are customarily relied upon by the Brazilian Supreme Court as the base of, <coughs> for their arguments. The same is happening in administrative law. With the movement led by Professor Susan Rose Ackerman from Yale Law School, for the dissemination of research and comparative and global administrative law, there is an important new field of academic studies involving analysis of common issues in favor of democracy, including administrative transparency, procedures, accountability, and government regulation. Mostly everything is regulated. The energy is regulated. The transportation is regulated. The education is regulated. Everything is regulated by the government. A lot of red tape, Micro-regulation, over-regulation, so this is very, very important issue for the academia. And the regulation could be made by the unitary executive, by the president and the ministers, secretaries, or by an independent agency with some characteristics created by the United States of America. So, Considering the Brazilian agency model is close, very close, and was influenced by the system of independent regulatory agency of the United States of America, it's appropriate, in my view, to conduct legal research from a comparative perspective in this issue. Having gone through several phases during its history, the long-lived American agency model is very rich, containing elements that could contribute to the clearing up of certain misunderstandings about the Brazilian regulatory standard. In my remarks today, I plan to highlight how the United States of America built an intellectual and practical ideology of regulation that Brazil needs to do right now. Brazil is living in a very tough moment shocked by the systemic corruption and fraud in the political field, and it's going to have a new president in January, promising a huge privatization program. So, like what happened in the New Deal reforms here in the United States of America, this issue is very important to social and economic development of the country. Speaking about the USA, for historical purposes, the Interstate Commerce Commission marks the beginning <coughs> of the implementation of this bureaucratic standard in the regulation of public utilities involving the complex rail system that went beyond the border of the states. While the Interstate Commerce Commission marks the beginning of the stage, the United States of America had already had some economic regulation since the mid-19th century regarding transport by steamers. At the end, at that period, there is no agency like now, but there was a uh, the steamboat inspectors very close to the model created in 1887 with the ICC. About this, 
I strongly recommend the book of Professor Jerry Machaw, who we had the pleasure to have a meeting today early at the Yale Law School. And the book is entitled Creating the Administrative Constitution. This terrific book is the first to look at administration and administrative law in the earliest <laughs> days of the American Republic. Professor Jerry Marshall demonstrates that from the very beginning, Congress delegated vast discretion to administrative officials and armed them with extrajudicial adjudicatory rulemaking and enforcement authority. In the early 20th century, the progressive movement raised the agents more against the chaotic scenario revolving around the government at the end of the 19th century. The movement spread through the middle class located in urban areas shocked by the corruption and fraud in the political field. It happened in the United States in the 30s. The solution to these problems was to create agencies to control certain industrial activities that should be decided by experts rationally and free from partisan pressures in the format known as spoil system. The New Deal era, in the 30s, phase known as the New Deal era, several federal agencies were created to regulate transport, aviation, labor, gas, etc. Considering the impact of agency decisions on the lives of citizen businesses, a statute was enacted in 1946 to proceduralize their actions, bring transparency, and guarantee fundamental rights. The Administrative Procedure Act was enacted to guide the operation of the agencies, detailing the mechanisms of action. Indeed, the APA provides guidelines for the issuing of regulatory standards, hearings and society participation, judgment of individual case, and in addition, parameters for the judicial control of the acts of the agents by the courts that we call the Academia Judicial Review. The APA is the true constitution of the administrative law of the federal law. In the U.S. model, the agents represent what is known in Brazil as the decentralized public administration, endowed with effective managerial autonomy. The actions of an agent must comply with the details contained in its laws of creation. When there is a dispute about its action, courts examine the data in accordance with the pure standards established by the law that granted powers to the agency, generally keeping the regulatory choice due to do what is informally known as the principle of deference. Most of the laws of creation of agencies have vague and open terms that the doctrine calls intelligible principles, allowing the agency flexibility and even discretion to create its own rules and procedures. With this background, despite some opponents, the U.S. regulation model has been kept since the 19th century to the present day with the support of the Supreme Court. Gary Lawson, a Boston University School of Law professor who took his J.D. at the Yale Law School, comments the abandonment of the theory of non-delegation doctrine before the courts, claiming that even the head of the executive branch who might eventually question some delegation, has no objection. And I quote, the rationale for this virtually complete abandonment of the non-delegation principle is simple. The court believes, possibly correctly, that the modern administrative state could not function if Congress were actually required to make a significant percentage of the fundamental policy decisions. Judicial opinions candidly acknowledge this rationale for permitting delegations. For example, the majority in Mistreta versus the United States declared that our jurisprudence has been driven by a practical understanding that in our increasingly complex society, replete with ever-changing and more technical problems, Congress simply cannot do its job absent an ability to delegate power under broad general directives. When faced with, faced with 
a choice between the Constitution and the structure of modern governance, the court has had no difficulty making the choice. Contrary to conventional wisdom, neither did the Reagan and Bush administrations. Neither President Reagan nor President Bush ever veto or opposed legislation on the express ground that is violated the non-delegation doctrine. Nor, to my knowledge, did the Reagan Bush Justice Department ever formally make such an objection to proposed or actual legislation. And I unquote. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court validated tenure and the delegation of powers and recognized the legality in the accumulation of quasi-legislative, quasi-executive, and quasi-judicial functions. Presently, the U.S. model agents favor the occupation of position by ex experts, public participation, transparency in procedures, and decisions with a procedural safeguard system similar to the judicial, judicial model. Let's talk a little bit about Brazil. The Brazilian agency model is, like I said, a partial reproduction of an existing standard in the United States of America. The master plan, uh, plan of the state governance reform in 19, issued in 1995, <coughs> brought a new model of independent regulatory agencies in order to restructure public administration. It was implemented at a time of the restructuring of the state's way of intervening in the economy during the administration of former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Mr. Cardoso led a huge privatization program. At that stage, the creation of regulatory agency was paramount. First, to attract private capital, especially foreign capital. And second, to deal with technical issues for decentralizing the executive power. The goal was lending some predictability and making the agency less susceptible to conflicts and polit political interests typical of the routines of the Brazilian Congress. Bringing novelty to both Brazilian constitutional and administrative law, independent regulatory agencies were created under a special autarky nature. First, headed by a collegiate body. Second, granting tenure for its commissioners. Third, it was created with administrative autonomy. And fourth, they received quasi-executive, quasi-legislative, and quasi-judicial functions that we call adjudicatory powers. Right now, Brazil has independent regulatory commission, commissions in relevant industrial sectors like, like oil and gas industry, energy, electric energy power, healthcare, transportation, and telecom. The introduction of regulatory agents brought some legal controversies in Brazil. First, the offense, the offense to the principle of the separation of power. Second, the delegation of powers from the legislative branch to an elected commissioners. Third, the violation of the principle of the unitary executive. And fourth, the lack of legitimacy of the commissioners of independent agents holding fixed terms. Like what happened in the United States. The debate is very close to, to what had happened in the United States, especially in, with, after the New Deal era. With the revolution that we were talking about, Professor uh, Daniel, the revolution of 1937 in the United States. <clears throat> Looking toward the constitutionality of the Brazilian model, in two cases, the Supreme Court validated the tenure system. The normative functions We've mentioned to the so-called intelligible principles, that is a theory created in the United States Academia, and the decision-making authority. It's important to stress that the Brazilian bureaucracy, even with the advent of regulatory agencies, 
is this still different from the United States bureaucratic system in terms of governability and governance structures. It's closer, but it's not exactly the same model. However, there is no doubt that part of the institutional design granting tenure to the agency commissioners and decision-making autonomy was, really was, influenced by the American model. Indeed, because of these factors, analyze should be produced about, about what happened and has been happening in the North American model in the various stage, stages along its over 150 years of history. Especially at this moment when big tech giants such as Uber, Google, and Facebook are acting like global service providers beyond borders. And you know, the structure created by Uber, for example, is the same here in New Haven, or in Rio, or in Istanbul, or in Tel Aviv, or everywhere. 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 So how to deal with this kind of structure using the traditional administrative law? the law passed by the Congress and go to the veto or not veto by the President and done, we solve the problem? That's the point. And everything is regulated. That's my point. How to deal with it with the modern, the, the, the structure of the law or the, the rule of law created 200 years ago? For the American, in, in, in the pursuit to improve the regulatory state, both the positive and negative aspects of the governance system should be analyzed both the, by Brazilian and the American Academy. For the American Academy, this question would be interesting to research empirically how an administrative system created to be applied locally was absorbed in another country with a very different culture and economic and social conditions. Otherwise, some matters related to the American system of regulatory agencies can contribute to the development of Brazilian agencies. And not only in regards to the administrative law, it would, it would be helpful to further research in several areas. And this event, this symposium, is very important, in my humble opinion, to this kind of uh, discussion. In conclusion, the studies could contribute to debates on the Brazilian regulatory standard aiming to improve or to identify potential measures to be investigated, investigated in greater deepness. Thank you for your time.